Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is John Burris. I am the rector here at St. Stephen's, and on behalf of the Episcopal Church in Alabama and St. Stephen's, we are delighted to welcome you here this evening to hear the Reverend Dr. Sam Wells. Um, just a little bit, there are bathrooms right out to the right um, if you walk out of the parish hall. Um, delighted y'all are here. A little bit about St. Stephen's. We have four pillars in our church that kind of define how we understand the church. It is about caring for people in our community, pastoral care. Um, it is about the way that we care for creation. So a lot of our programs are intentional about our connection to nature and God's sacred gift. Um, the way that we care for those who are in need, our outreach ministries, including the way that that shapes us and our own needs. Um, and finally, we take formation seriously, and so I'm delighted that um, you can be a part of one of our formation offerings. Um, I hope it's meaningful and, and, and shapes your own faith this evening. And before um, our Associate Rector for Formation and Outreach introduces um, the Reverend Dr. Wells, um, I'll invite Frank Holmes to read um, a little bit of scripture to begin our evening. This is a reading from 2 Kings. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man and in high favor with his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. The man, though a mighty warrior, suffered from leprosy. Now the Arameans, on one of their raids, had taken a young girl captive from the land of Israel, and she served Na Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my Lord were the prophet who is in, Samar in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and told his Lord just what the girl from the land of Israel had said. And the king of Aram said, Go then, and I will send along a letter to the king of Israel. He went, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of garments. He brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent you my servant Naaman, that you may cure him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to give life or death, that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Just look and see how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent a message to the king. Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me, that he may learn that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and halted at the entrance of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a message to him, saying, Go wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored and you shall be clean. But Naaman became angry and went away, saying, I thought that for me he would surely come out and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and will wave his hand over the spot and cure the leprosy. Are not Abana and Parfar the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Could not I wash in them and be clean? He turned and went away in a rage. But his servants approached him and said to him, Father, if the prophet had commanded you to do something difficult, would you not have done it? How much more when he said, all he said to you was, wash and be clean. So he went down and immersed himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. His flesh was restored like the flesh of a young boy, and he was clean. The word of the Lord. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. A leper came to him begging, and kneeling, he said to him, If you choose, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I do choose, be made clean. Immediately, the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. 
After sternly warning him, he sent him away at once, saying to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go. Show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded as a testimony to them. But he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the word so that Jesus could no longer go into a town openly, but stayed out in the country. And people came to him from every quarter. The Gospel of the Lord. So we're pleased to be able to welcome Sam Wells here to St. Stephen's, and we're glad all of you could join us this evening, whether you're here with us in the parish hall or at home watching on our live stream. Welcome. We just had the privilege of having Sam Wells with us at our diocesan convention at Camp, Camp McDowell the past few days where we thought about other topics that I think kind of laid a great foundation for our topic tonight the topic of God walking with us through fire, God restoring us after times of loss and grief, and then the idea of being with as really what a lot of our belief in Christ and our ministry as a church comes down to. So um, Sam Wells has written a lot about these things. We read some of his books together in my seminary formation at the Seminary of the Southwest, including Nazareth Manifesto, Improvisation, there's a number of other books uh, that you can find. And so tonight, he's going to guide us um, in thinking about Does God Heal? So, welcome. Oh, go on. Um, well, uh, Bishop Grenda, thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Becky. And thanks all everyone who's turned out tonight. It's a real thrill uh, to be with you. As far as I can tell, there's two kinds of healing in the church. We could call them loud healing and quiet healing. Loud healing involves a lot of shouting, uses plenty of expansive hand gestures, and often stretches the name of Jesus to four syllables. Quiet healing uses words like wholeness and journey a lot, tends to avoid large crowds, and is pretty resistant to definitions except that it knows it wants to keep a mighty long way from loud healing. Naaman the Syrian, the large egoed Syrian general at the center of the Old Testament story so beautifully read for us tonight, is very much in the loud healing camp. He wants a big audience, including the king of Israel. He's happy to write a, fight, a fat check, and he wants Elisha to stand before him and wave his hands around and perform a spectacular cure. Naaman is healed, but it's not a loud healing that heals him. It's the quiet words of his wife's Israelite slave girl and the simple washing in the River Jordan that end up making his skin as smooth as that of a young boy. He moves from arrogance to demand, from demand to disappointment, from disappointment to humility and from humility to simple obedience. If the prophet had commanded you to do something difficult, say his servants, would you not have done it? How much more when all he said to you was wash and be clean? Turned out Naaman had to be healed of his pretension before he could be healed of his leprosy. No loud healing for him. By the end, God has not only given this man a fresh body, but he's put a new man in that body. There are a lot of healing stories in the scriptures, and it's easy to glaze over and think that's just another healing story. It becomes one of the greatest barriers between ourselves and the world of the Bible. Back then, healings seemed to be two a penny, 
while today they seem thin on the ground. It gets us into the way of thinking the Bible isn't really a story about us. But in fact, there's no such thing as just a healing story. Every healing story in the Bible is there for a reason and is telling us something specific about salvation. Because in the New Testament, healing and salvation are more or less the same thing. We find that hard to grasp because we've got hold of the idea that healing is a present thing for the body while salvation is a future thing for the soul. But that's not what the New Testament is saying. For the Bible, salvation is a personal, social, and cosmic thing that refers to everything God wants for us and every way God touches our lives. Healing is the same. When I was a young teenager, my mother sat me down on the sofa one Friday night and said, Samuel, I have something to tell you. Those words have ever since sent cold shivers down my spine. She held my hand and she said, I'm going to die. The cancer in my body is not going to get better and in a few months it's going to kill me. I was stunned. It turned out she was right. She didn't get better. And some while later, just as she said, she died. And from the moment she told me to the moment she died, I never once prayed for her to be healed. Ours was a household that didn't do loud healing. My mother was a nurse. For her, it was about accepting facts. And yet, ever since, I've wondered whether my refusal to pray for healing was a lack of faith on my part, a desire to protect myself from disappointment, a resistance to showing God how naked and defenseless I was, an urge perhaps more than anything else to protect God from my own anger and despair and terror. I'm not saying if I'd prayed for healing, my mother would have got better. I'm not saying it's fair to judge a kid who's out of his depth in every way. But I am saying that if salvation is what the gospel is about, then healing is something we pray for, and that my reluctance to do so was more about self-protection and a misguided God-protection than it was about faith. The gospel and healing don't always come together, but they're wrapped up in one another. The mistake is to assume we can have one without the other. To understand the relationship between healing and salvation, we need to name precisely what salvation is. It's about past and future. Salvation is the transformation of our past from a burden to a gift, from a place of grief and regret to a heritage of wisdom and joy. And salvation is the transformation of our future from a curse to a blessing, from a place of fear and death to a destiny of hope and glory. When we talk about the salvation of the past, we call it the forgiveness of sins. When we talk about the salvation of the future, we call it eternal life. These are the gifts Jesus brought in his life, death, and resurrection, the forgiveness of sins and everlasting life, the restoration of the past and the promise of the future. This is what salvation is. And so what is healing? Well, we know that even when we've been forgiven, there's still a mess to clear up. Forgiveness takes away the guilt and the blame and the enmity and the shame. 
but it doesn't immediately take away the pain and the loss and the hurt and the damage. Something else is required. And we also know that eternal life may last forever. But there's some parts of it we'd like right now. Because there are parts of ourselves and our lives and our relationships and our communities that are diseased and deathly and disordered and distressed. Something is required right now, a kind of advance payment of eternal life. And the name we give to those two things, the part that remains to be done when forgiveness has finished its work, and the part that we need to be done right now, despite our hope for life eternal, is the same name. That name is healing. Healing is the third part of salvation, the part sandwiched between forgiveness and eternal life. This is what salvation means. There's forgiveness, there's eternal life, and in between filling up any space that may linger between forgiveness and everlasting life, there's healing. Some while ago, I was talking with a friend who teaches at a boarding school. He told me how a 14-year-old boy was dying of cancer and how it was dominating the life of the school, testing everyone's faith to the limit. I decided to leave my compassionate pastoral hat on the peg for a few minutes and ask some simple direct questions. Does the boy have any friends? Oh yes, said my friend. He's found who his true friends are and made some of the deep deepest friendships between teenage boys I've ever seen. How are the boy's parents? It's wonderful how the whole community's embraced them like an extended family. They often turn up during the week unannounced and stay over. Does the boy have faith? You know, he wasn't one of the especially religious ones, but I've often been with him and given him the sacrament and kept silence and held his hand and there's an incredible feeling in that room. I guess this must have been your worst semester in teaching. Well, you know, in a way it's been my best because there's been a meaning and purpose about the whole school I've never known before. It feels like a transfiguration. And then I took a risk and said, what you're describing doesn't sound like hell. It sounds like the kingdom of God. This boy isn't being healed, but he sure is bringing salvation. There was a long silence. My friend was in tears. I wish now we'd hugged, but you have to understand we were male and British. <laughs> so instead we talked about the England soccer team <laughs> and whether there was any chance the new coach would get them to the World Cup finals in the following year. <coughs> My friend's head was spinning, but he needed a bit of time for his breaking heart to catch up. By the end of the walk, his anger and bewilderment was turning to thankfulness and an extraordinary kind of joy. These are things you only get to say to a very close friend or a complete stranger. What I was trying to explain was, if you've truly known the forgiveness of sins, and if eternal life really has intruded on your here and now, healing may not be quite so important to you. Because healing names the gap between forgiveness and eternal life. And very occasionally, like at that school, the gap is actually very small. Of course, they still long longed for the boy to recover. But forgiveness had done its work and eternal life was very tangible and the kingdom of God was close at hand. If you have forgiveness and eternal life, you don't need healing quite as badly. You don't have to believe God sent the cancer or suffering has a purpose or any of that stuff. You just have to see that God offers us forgiveness and eternal life and sometimes in our most extreme situations, we and those around us are more aware of that than ever.
many years ago. I had a young man in my adult confirmation class. He walked a bit on the wild side, and his girlfriend was pretty wild too, although she didn't always walk on the same wild side that he walked on. One morning I heard from her that they'd split up and that she hadn't seen him in days. An hour later I heard he'd woken up 12 hours after taking a bottle of Tylenol. I sat with him in the hospital as he lost consciousness, his liver being long gone. His brothers had turned up from all over the country and their sober conclusion was that he was dying as impetuously and tragically as he'd lived leaving a long trail of emotional and physical wreckage behind him. The following morning, I got a call to say he'd been given a liver transplant and was regaining consciousness. I couldn't believe it. I rushed to the ward and to my dismay, I found the angriest man I've ever seen. He'd meant to commit suicide and we was dis discovering he'd been foiled and he was incandescent with rage. I tell this story because by sheer medical criteria it ought to be a story of healing, but it obviously isn't. There's more to healing than getting a new liver when you've destroyed your old one. I tell the story because it's the opposite of the 14-year-old boy in the school. What my teacher friend discovered was that when you have forgiveness and eternal life, you don't need healing quite as badly. What my wild friend discovered was that if you're a million miles from forgiveness and eternal life, healing isn't really going to help you. At that boarding school, forgiveness and eternal life were so close that the kingdom of God had come very near. In that critical care ward, forgiveness and eternal life were so far away there was simply way too much for healing to do on its own. What we think is we want is healing. What we truly need is forgiveness and eternal life. Sometimes we get healing, sometimes we don't. If we get healing in the context of forgiveness in the past and hope for eternal life in the future, it's a kind of fulfillment of forgiveness and an anticipation of eternal life. If we get healing in the absence of the things we really need, we may find it pretty much useless. And that brings us back to Naaman. He comes down from Syria, pumping his chest and demanding healing. Elisha is too busy to see him. Of course, Elisha's not really sitting in his study, taking a conference call from the State Department. He's teaching Naaman a lesson. If you receive healing right now, Elisha's saying, that healing ain't going to help you. Naaman's got to get down from his high horse and chariot first. And notice at the end of the story, Naaman praises and worships the God of Israel. Here's our context, forgiveness and eternal life, restored relationships and the dismantling of death in the face of God's glory. Oh, and sandwiched in between, healing. Healing in the only context in which it makes any sense. What can I get you, sir? I'll take a healing, please. Would you like that with forgiveness and eternal life, sir? No, thanks. I'll take it as it comes. That's the human condition. We want healing without salvation. But what does God offer us? God offers us forgiveness of sins and life eternal. That's salvation. That's where healing is truly to be found. And sometimes sandwiched in between is healing, sometimes not. And of course we long for the healing. Of course we do. I did as a teenager. My friend did at his school. Everyone here has done it some time or another. Some people here are doing so right now more deeply than anything they know. And of course we pray. And what God gives us over and again is forgiveness and eternal life, everything we need in the past and everything we could imagine for the future. 
and sometimes they're so close together that we call it healing. And sometimes even when they aren't especially close together, healing comes and fills that gap. And sometimes healing comes, but forgiveness and eternal life are so far away that the healing is no good to us. So the question, does God heal, can only be asked alongside the question, does God save? And these are the answers. Does God heal me? Sometimes. Does God save me? Always. 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 going to invite you to, to find someone close to you, maybe who you came with tonight or maybe somebody you've met for the first time tonight and just share with them what you're feeling and thinking right now. We'll do that for two or three minutes.
Okay, I'm going to get you to um, save the rest for later, uh, for the journey home. Uh, so you know how to do this. You, you put your hand in the air, and then Becky, I think, is going to come and find you. Uh, and then you're going to speak into a microphone. I think you know how to do that. I've done that before. So, and it doesn't have to be about specifically about what I've been talking about. It doesn't have to be a question. It can be an observation, but it can be something that this has made you wonder about on a wider canvas. It's it's whatever you want to talk about. It's your time. So, who would like to to start? John has uh, John has found a way to make Becky go a long distance. So, and, and if, you, if you put your hand up, even if somebody else is talking, then Becky knows where to take the microphone next. Um, so, uh, I think John, John is, uh, he sat at the front from the front row for a reason. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious, um, as we think about healing, um, one of my observations that, and I, and I think summed up, we were talking at our table at convention about an article, an opinion article in the Times this morning, that people that have had relationships in the U.S. for 20 years, the, the polarization um, has divided people. Um, you, you can find out that somebody has this vile feeling towards you and you towards them almost instantaneously, and it's changing relationships and communities. Um, and so when I think about healing, I wonder what that looks like and how that's lived out, um, especially in Christian community. Um, the Episcopal Church being a place that has historically done a good job of holding diverse groups of people together, um, and it's feeling strained. Um, and I personally am praying for healing. And I um, mean, yeah, curious your comments, thoughts about that. Well, that's, that's a big question. I'd, uh, what I'm hoping to do in the next two minutes is to resolve the unresolved issues in American political, political life. Um, so um, hold, hold on to your seat and we'll see what we can do. Um, okay, I, I can't do this without treading on some toes, so forgive me in advance. Um, Okay, the first thing to say is one's view of who the president should be or who should make up the Supreme Court or what economic policies should be pursued or how many migrants should be let into the country or even whether abortion should be legally permitted uh, and whether euthanasia should be easily permitted, or what the Bible says about sexuality, just to take the first 10 that come into my head. <laughs> I don't know a single person for whom those are the 10 most important things in their life. When we choose to make those things the most, our defining characteristics, we're defining something ourselves by something that isn't identical with our baptism. The most important thing in all of our lives t here tonight is that we are baptized children of God. That's who we are as people. <clears throat> and when we see a person who says something with whom we profoundly disagree, including a person whose disagreements affect what we feel is part of our identity, we imagine them as a child in the arms of the priest that baptized them, and we see them as that baby. We see them as that vulnerable, fragile human being. And we recognize the different influences of their life, uh, nature and nurture, that have gone to making them who they are, and we see the pain that has led to some of the hurtful things they feel called to say about us and people like us but we don't define them by those things. We see them fundamentally as children of God, just as we are ourselves. We have more in common than the things that separate us. That's the first thing we've got to say. Then the second thing is, how do we most appropriately show that? 
Well, <clears throat> some people feel that the divisions in American society will only end with a good war. You don't need me to tell you there's no such thing as a good war. But what a good war is, I think, what people mean by a good war, is a cause that's greater than these things that divide us, about which we, we can unite. Now I'm going to say something that's controversial. None of what I've said so far is controversial. <laughs> You'd think that the two greatest challenges that arguably hum humankind has ever faced would be those uniting causes around which all the divisions that I've just mentioned would just fall away as relatively trivial. One of those is climate change. Uh, humanity has never faced that issue before. It's something that could make the world uninhabitable by the end of this century. I'd like to think it's something we could unite around. It doesn't seem to be, we're quite, we're quite there yet, but we're going to get there sooner or later because the evidence is going to be incontrovertible before, uh, oh well, probably just after it becomes reversible. And the other thing is artificial intelligence, which no one seems to be talking about, but offers to put almost all of us out of our jobs and change the whole identity of what it means to be a human being. So once you've named the, those two things, the thing that changes the whole nature of being a human being and the one that threatens within the lifetimes of those now being born to make the planet uninhabitable, you'd think we would have two causes that needed our unity in a way that made our divisions both trivial and indulgent. Somebody needs to come out and say that. I'm not hearing enough people say that. These divisions are an indulgence. We have major issues to face together as a planet. And frittering our time away by divisions about tax policy or policy on migration is self-indulgence. So we must unite around the things that takes all of us to fix rather than fritter time away with things that divide us. So that's the second thing to say. And then the third thing to say, which I talked a little bit about at the conference, is we, we must show people who disagree with us ways in which we need them. You know, 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, it's a very clear and simple message. We are the body of Christ. The eye does not say to the hand, I have no need of you. The Republican does not say to the Democrat, I despise you. It's a luxury we can't afford. We need each other. We have challenges to face, and we need to show each other that. Now, one thing I learned is in uh, my seven years living in North Carolina was that when somebody else was in trouble, you went round to the hou their house, and they opened the door, and you say, I brought pie. And it seems to me, I brought pie as a way of saying, I can't fix the fact that your daughter is seriously ill, but I understand your humanity. And despite the fact we disagreed about the flowers at last Thanksgiving, we'll say no more about that. <laughs> I recognize that I have something I can give you. It doesn't solve the problem, but it's a way of showing, I see you, I hear you, I'm walking with you. That option, pie, is to, uh, whether any of those pies ever get eaten is not the point. The point is the gesture. And when words fail, and bad words have been said on Twitter, why anyone ever uses Twitter is beyond me. It just seems to make enemies. But when words fail, uh, and Twitter has inflated things, then gestures have to take over. And it's up to us to make gestures. And if I'm doing okay with this microphone, it's probably my fault. I'll just say one more thing, um, which I... Uh, this is a big build-up now, isn't it? I'm just going to say one more thing. Um, 
you you okay with this if I keep going? Okay, okay. Um, which I should I sh uh, oh I'm not getting any microphone at all here. Even bigger build up. I think you're okay now, are we? Okay. Um, which I should have said at the conference. Which is, you know, I've only been in Alabama for a short time. What do I know? But I've actually been in, you know, but I've actually been in very few places in the United States in the last six or seven years where people across the political divide in this country went to church together to the same d degree that they do in the Diocese of Alabama. You know, the truth is if you go to some parts of the country, Episcopalians are all red, and if you go to other parts of the country, Episcopalians are all blue. Here, it seems to me about half and half, from what I can tell, with the most discreet conversations I could have in the last couple of days. Um, I just wonder if the Diocese of Alabama has got a vocation to take that as a gift. That here is a part of America where people who think they're divided meet together at the altar table every Sunday. Isn't that a wonderful witness? Of course, the pastoral strategy might be never to name it. I think that would be a missed opportunity. Because I think together, rightly or wrongly, you've found a forbearance in this diocese that very few people have around America. I think you've got some good news that could have an effect not just on this diocese but on the whole country. I just want you to think about that. I think that's where vocations begin. I could, I could speak into that one tonight. If people just, s how about if, if people, oh, if people just shout out the question and I'll repeat it, how about that? So, who's next? I think Becky, you're out of a job. Go on. Um, I think there are there are two approaches. So the question is, do, have I ever in my pastoral experience run into people who know that God has forgiven them and understand that God has forgiven them, but in truth can't forgive themselves? I think that's the majority of people that I know. Um, and, you know, I'm a very gentle person, you understand. Uh, but gently, and that usually means over a series of conversations rather than one, um, you're gently showing someone that th what they're suffering from is a very sort of low status version of the sin of pride. Because pride says, whatever God may say, I know better. And if God has forgiven you, what God has rejoined, let no individual doubt or separate, to coin a phrase. Uh, but that's not the kind of thing you can say to someone in the first conversation you have with them. Because it, to say, I can't forgive myself, sounds like a kind of repentance. Um, but 
forgiveness is is I well, I was going to say fifty fifty, but it forgiveness is partly a work of grace and partly an act of will. And different people, um, you know, struggle with the two halves of that. Yeah, I'm talking about when you're forgiving somebody else. Uh, but it does, in my experience, require both of those. Um, but when you can't forgive yourself, you know, what I, uh, what I really think is happening is you can't let go of your fundamental desire to control the story. And the idea that you can ruin, fundamentally ruin the story in such a way that you can't be forgiven is to suggest that the Holy Spirit is not capable of weaving your um, knife slice through the tapestry into an even more beautiful picture, which is believing that your power for ill is greater than the Holy Spirit's power for good. Well, that's pride. So the first step, I think, is to, to hear the, the depth of what, what they feel they've done. And you know that's why the sacrament of confession is obviously such a great thing however it's exercised. Um, but there are four words in ministry that I find are more powerful than any other words. And they tend to come about 40 minutes after the y you've, you've started meeting with someone when they've poured out the story. And she was my best friend and I... Her husband and I were, you know, we, we always thought we just got along and then somehow there was more in it and, you know, and, and you, know, you, you have the whole story. <coughs> and then there's a pause after 40 minutes when they've told you the story. Almost never the first person they've told the story to. So there's a kind of rounded shape to it. And then, the f then you say, after a pause, the most powerful words in ministry, which are, was there something else? The, the most powerful words in ministry, which are, was there something else? Which is to say, okay, you've, give, you've told me the story you tell everybody. Now tell me the real story. Uh, that's what I call the second question. The first question is always for me, so where does the story start? And the second question is, was there something else? And so sometimes what you find is, when you ask the second question, is they'll tell you a rather different story. But it's the same story. It's a bit like a, you know, a, a trilogy that tells the same story from different points of view. They'll tell, tell you a slightly different version of the same story, or they'll take the story back to their childhood where you know they lost a loved one very young and they never trusted to love someone so they couldn't love just one person they wanted to hedge their bets and so they tended to have three people at a time you know that kind of they'll go a little bit further back <coughs> and so what you're doing with that second story is you're placing the first story in a wider context which is a context that doesn't center that person, to use the language of decentering, which is very common at the moment. You're decentering them from the story. Um, and then at some stage, y you've got to get to the point where you say, so, so what do you think God really feels about you now? And of course you don't, usually ask that question until you think you know the answer <laughs> um, and you know the answer usually is I, I think I, I think God wants me to come home and at that point you know once you've got there then you say so what's stopping you which is my inability to let God be the center of the story 
which is pretty much the definition of sin in the first place. So what presents itself as repentance, which is I've done this terrible thing and I can't ever forgive myself, in fact ends up being almost the definition of sin. But you don't say that to someone in the first 10 minutes after they walk in the room. Who's next? Okay. <clears throat> what do we do with the miracle healings or miracle stories in general in the New Testament or in the Gospels? The inbreaking of the kingdom they represent. Well, to me, the distinction between the parables and the healing stories is an overdrawn distinction because they're both portrayals of the kingdom. But there we, we also need to remember uh, something about context. So I guess the most obvious story in which we forget context is the story of the Gerasene demoniac where the, uh, all the demons go out of the man into the pigs and the pigs run over the cliff. So just, you know, very briefly and to explain that, and I'm sure everybody here uh, may well know what I'm about to say, but I'll say it anyway. Um, what are the two clues in that story? The clue number one is what were pigs doing in a place that didn't eat pork? It seems a reasonable question. And also, what does the name legion represent? You know, the pigs were being kept to feed the Roman legions. The Roman legions were the demons that were possessing the body that was Israel. This is a story about Israel as a profoundly diseased body um, to such an extent that even the farmers were part of the you know, min military industrial complex that was making the occupation of Palestine at the time happen. So that's not to say that the pigs didn't run over the cliff, but it's to say why is this story in the New Testament? Because it's got these different layers. And so, you know, I'm not going to stand here and go through all the miracles in the same way, but to take, um, you know, to take maybe one other one, 
jo John 21, the miraculous catch of fish, 153 fish. Peter's been uh, fishing all night. Jesus comes along, doesn't know it's Jesus, tells him to fish on the other side uh, of the boat. You know, what? what is that story saying? It seems to me that's saying the early church has to change one thing, <laughs> fish on the other side of the boat, and if it does, it will catch 153 fish, which one might imagine is roughly the number of the nations in the world. I mean, there's currently, you know, 206 nations in the Olympic Games, so in the ancient world we'll take a few off of that, and we get to about 153. This is saying you need to fish... For Gentiles, it seems to me. That again, that's not saying there wasn't a miraculous catch of fish, but that's saying why what is this doing? You know, why did John's gospel get elongated by one chapter to include this story and a couple of other similar ones? To because this is a point that didn't come through clearly in the first twenty chapters of John and it needs to be reinforced. Seems to me that's how it happened. So so th so the idea of you know do we have journalists on the spot? Do we have scientific investigators on the spot? Can we actually prove that these things happened? Seems to me a very 21st century way of asking the question about the miracles. It seems to me the kind of illustrations I've just given are what the miracles are inviting us. But you do have to do a bit of work. You know, the, what we tend to forget is that the New Testament wasn't written for 21st century people. It was written for first century people and they knew what these signals were. You know, I don't suppose anyone reading John's Gospel or Mark's Gospel would have not picked up the reference to Legion or not picked up the reference to 153. You know, they, that was code that they were all familiar with. We're just not. That's because we're living 20 centuries later. So, to me, it's not really a question of did this happen in this way. Uh, it's... I assume something profound happened, otherwise the story wouldn't have been passed down. But, you know, it's a bit like the Turin Shroud. I sort of think if, if the Turin Shroud doesn't prove anything to me, it proves that there was an empty shroud that may or may not have been Jesus. It doesn't prove what matters to me. What matters to me is the resurrection of Jesus. Well, the Turin Shroud doesn't prove that. Uh, it provides some circumstantial detail that that's, you know, that goes in the same direction. It <laughs> certainly doesn't prove anything. Um, so the miracles themselves don't get us anywhere. But what, when you add the wonder of the miracles, the effect they had on the people around them, and then the extra layers that I've just been talking about, now we're in a conversation. Um, so that's how I approach the miracles. How are we doing? Maybe time for one or two more. Address when when the name of your talk was was, was discussed, some of us thought about physical <coughs> healing, and others thought spiritual healing. Mm. And I just would like for you to, um, in using the word healing, talk a little bit about the differences and uh, how you approach spiritual thing, healing. Well, well, I, I guess, guess that's, that's kind of, if you, if you go back to the two, so, that, so the question is, could I say a bit more about the difference between spiritual and physical healing, and particularly say a bit more about spiritual healing? I mean, I'm just going to give a short answer to that one, because if you think about the story about the Tylenol man, and the story about the 14-year-old in the boarding school, it seems to me... The Tylenol man got physical healing, but he certainly didn't get spiritual healing. The boy in the boarding school did not get physical healing, but he certainly got spiritual healing, and so did the whole institution. I know which one I prefer. My guess is the Tylenol man's still alive, but the 14-year-old boy died about 25 years ago. So, in a sense, that's kind of what the talk was about, <laughs> is, is you, you pays your money, you takes your choice in a way. Um, you know, spiritual healing, it seems to me, is a way of talking about what happens when forgiveness and eternal life are about that far apart. Physical healing, um, if, 
if eternal if forgiveness and eternal life are kind of that far apart, physical healing isn't that much good to you. That's how I see it. Um, I just don't want to... I, 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 the reason I'm hesitating to give a longer answer is I, I don't... And this may sound like a huge thing to say at the end of an evening, but I don't really agree with the hard and fast distinction between spiritual and physical. To me, that's a... That comes from Greek philosophy, which is in tension with the philosophy of the New Testament and leads to ideas of a spiritual resurrection rather than a physical one. Um, Christianity is a physical religion that begins with the incarnation of Jesus as fully, fully human and fully enfleshed at Christmas. And so I don't, I'm a bit nervous of talking about spirit, spirituality, spiritual healing in a way that somehow makes that superior to the physical because we are physical beings um, and our spirituality expressed through our bodies as well as in other ways. So that's why I'm slightly pushing back about the, the, the some of the, the vocabulary there um, and why I talked about you know the story about my mother in the sense that um, I think it's perfectly natural to pray for physical healing and right that we do I just tried in, the, in my remarks to give a few reasons why, if we don't get it, that that you know there may be good reasons why we don't get it. Um, one, go on, yeah. I uh, read meditations in the morning, and I read one two days ago, saying that the worst kind of loneliness is to be uncomfortable with yourself. And I believe in forgiveness and I work on it, but it's like there's something from childhood that keeps saying you're not good enough. If you did this okay, you won't do this okay. Can you put that in terms of your biblical knowledge and to help me come to grips with the solution to that? Um. Thank you. That's a beautiful question, and I'll try and paraphrase it with the microphone. Um, so the question is about how you come to terms with your own shortcomings and your sense of your own imperfections deeply laid, laid in you or on you since childhood, um, and, and, and how you learn to live with yourself. And you made the interesting comment that the deepest loneliness is not being able to be with yourself. Um, well, I, I think you're. I think you're absolutely right in the sense that uh, those of you who are on the conference will know that, particularly in my talk this morning, I talked about heaven as being four, four kinds of being with: being with God, being with yourself, being with one another, and being with the creation, or the renewed creation in the case of heaven. And I think all four count. And, and in a sense, that the, the first way to begin with that is to recognize that the, what's known as the, the summary of the law, you know, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself, is usually presented as two commandments. It's actually three. To love God, to love your neighbor, and to love yourself. Um, when it's when it says you shall love your neighbor as yourself, uh, you're being invited to love yourself as the first among the neighbors that you are called to love. Um, so denial of self isn't a form of holiness; it it's a form of lack of love. You know, it's 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 as bad as not loving your neighbor. Self-rejection is not the path of holiness. Um, and if you can't love yourself, it's arguable whether you can truly love anybody else. Now, there's no question that people of a certain generation, um, and perhaps still in some, in some places, have been taught as very young people and as children that love is a zero-sum game the less you love yourself, the more love you 
have to give to others. That's not what the New Testament teaches us. You know, that's not Christianity. I don't know what it is, but it's not Christianity. Christianity is, is the three loves, the love of God, the love of neighbor, and the love of self. Um, and so the truth is, for many wonderful, holy people, particularly people, you know, a little bit older than me, um, what healing means and what salvation means and what holiness means in the last chapter or two of their life is actually learning to love themselves, which, in my view, wrong-headed forms of teaching um, have encouraged them not to do at a formative stage of their lives. Um, and the rest of what I want to say about that is pretty similar to what I said to Peter about not forgiving yourself 10 minutes ago, which is to say, in the end, not loving yourself is a paradoxical form of pride because if God loves you, then if you don't love yourself, you're saying you know better than God, which is what pride is. Um, one of my great moments in ministry, I think, I don't know if all clergy have this, but, they, uh, but I have a sort of, you know, golden, after 30 years in ministry, I've got some sort of golden moments in ministry. And one of those was in the year 2000, when I was pastoring a very small church, and we were doing godly play, if people know what that is. And I was getting out the pieces of um, the Good Shepherd story, little wooden pieces, uh, on, and I was kneeling down on the floor, congregation mixture of adults and children. And I took out the pieces for the still waters and the green pastures and the places of danger and the sheepfold. And then I picked up the two or three of the, the sheep, which were made out of different kinds of wood. And I said, as a wandering, as you do in godly play, I wonder if it makes any difference that they're different colors. And one of the children said, um, it makes no difference, we should treat them all the same. I thought, okay, we've, we've had that class at school. <laughs> um, but I wasn't happy with that. So, uh, so I said, I wonder what makes them all the same. And there was really a long pause. None of the adults knew what to say. And this six-year-old girl at the back put her hand up, and I said, what, what would you like to say? And she said, they've all got the same shepherd. That's right at the top of my great moments in ministry <laughs> because it's basically saying our worth as human beings comes from the fact that God loves us so much as to become one of us in Christ. God could not possibly have gone any further to communicate love to us than that. And if we're not prepared to receive that, then we're saying to God, I'm afraid. We're either saying that doesn't count or you've got to do better. I'm not prepared to say that. I think that's all I need. And I hope it's all you need and that all of us here need. We've all got the same shepherd. Thank you for having me. As we wrap up this evening, we've heard reading of scripture, we've heard reflection and good news. And now we end in prayer. If you have a bulletin in front of you where there are bold words, I invite you to say those along with me because we pray this prayer together. Blessed are you, sovereign God, gentle and merciful creator of heaven and earth. Your word brought light out of darkness, and daily your spirit renews the face of the earth. When we turned away, from you in sin, your anointed Son took our nature and entered 
our suffering to bring your healing to those in weakness and distress. He broke the power of evil and set us free from sin and death that we might become partakers of his glory. His apostles anointed the sick in your name, bringing wholeness and joy to a broken world. By your grace renewed each day, you continue the gifts of healing in, in your church that your people may praise your name forever. By the power of your spirit, may your blessing rest on those who are anointed with this oil in your name. May they be made whole in body, mind, and spirit. Hear the prayer we offer for all your people. Remember in your mercy those for whom we pray. Heal the sick. Raise the fallen, strengthen the faint-hearted, and enfold in your love the fearful and those who have no hope. In the fullness of time, complete your gracious work. Reconcile all things in Christ and make them new, that we may be restored in your image, renewed in your love, and serve you as sons and daughters in your kingdom. Through your anointed Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit we lift our voices of thanks and praise. Blessed be God, our strength and our salvation, now and forever. Amen. We thank you all very much for coming. We thank you, Sam, for being with us. We thank you, Bishop G, for inviting him to be with us. And I would just also commend, um, for those who weren't at Diocesan Convention, all of um, all of Sam Wells's um, lectures and his sermon uh, given there over the past couple of days are on the Diocese of Alabama uh, YouTube channel and Facebook. And uh, I commend those um, to you as well. So. God bless you and keep you and shine his light on you and grant you peace. Go in peace. Amen.